There is terror on our streets. Last year, 11 people died in racist murders. Yet anti-racist campaigners are bitterly divided and are attracting new groups dedicated to violence. Families of murdered victims are appalled. Victims don't necessarily want demonstrations or wide, widespread violence. That's not the way forward. Tonight, we reveal the hard left groups who use anti-racism as an excuse for violent struggle. supporters turn up and make it plain to the fascists that they either go home or they're going to get a bathroom. But you're just defying violence here. You, you cannot fight violence with anything but violence. Left-wing theory put into practice last month. Ostensibly a peaceful protest in South London against the extreme right British National Party degenerates instead into confrontation with police. Tonight we talk to anti-racist protesters whose words stand as evidence of a disturbing change in tactics, fighting violence with violence. The target for that protest was the British National Party bookshop, an insignificant looking building in Welling, South London. The BNP encouraged racial violence by distributing literature from these headquarters that support Hitler's theories on race. 11 people were murdered in racist attacks last year and four in the last two years in the area close to the BNP's headquarters. The first of those was in February 1991. 15-year-old Roland Adams and his brother were waiting at a bus stop in nearby Thames Mead. There were just two black boys standing at a bus stop and they looked lightly targets to racists. They were verbally abused racially. Oi! Don't stand here. It's not your bus stop, nigger. It's not causing any trouble. Just leave us. Oi! Don't stand here. It's not your bus stop, nigger. Roland was stabbed. They both ran in separate direction. Roland was still pursued and he died running away from his attackers. Most of the well-thinking people in that area laid a wreath on the spot where my son died and the racists simply burnt them. In July last year, 16-year-old Rohit Dougal and a white friend went into a takeaway shop in Eltham to ask directions to a taxi firm. Ray was set upon by a gang of about six youths on his way home from a party that he attended with some school friends. He had um, stopped at a kebab shop to get some food on the way back and also get some instructions on how to get to a mini cab off the road. Hi, uh, yes, please. Do you know where we can find a taxi? Yeah, Within the actual the kebab shop, um, one of the lads had passed uh, a comment. Bag of chips as well. The road came out. Um, yeah. One of them followed up behind. All right, all right. Thanks, mate. Good night, lads. Two or three of the other guys knocked the chips out of his hands. Hey, you call me a The other lad then turned to Rose um, and then started attacking him. Do you know what this is? It's a knife. Road unfortunately got stuck between traffic trying to cross the road. Somebody pulled a knife and uh, stabbed him across the neck first. And Roy tried to defend himself across the arms. Um, Roy then managed to cross the road and this chap, as soon as the car had cleared, chased after him and stabbed him through the heart. <coughs> Right, lay there and died, I think, within an hour. And in April this year, 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence was waiting for a bus in Eltham. It was just 400 yards from where Rohit Dougal had been stabbed the previous summer. These boys came across the road and shouting that racist name. <laughs> and his friend said he had told Stephen to run, but Stephen didn't really see the danger, so he didn't run, but this other, his friend did. We'd think they used the word nigger. And when he looked around, he was just surrounded by these boys, and he just heard Stephen cry out. Stephen was stabbed a second time as he ran away. He ran for about 250 yards before he said, you know, I can't run anymore, you know, look what they've done to me, I can't run anymore. And that's when he collapsed. And at that point, I, I'm not sure if he died straight away, how, how long it took before he died. The tree that marks the spot where he died. The BNP has put their slogan on that tree. Close to the BNP headquarters, we spoke to a West Indian burnt out of his house by racists. 
and another frightened family attacked 12 times in recent years. We had quite a number of uh, things thrown at our house. Bricks that came through the, our conservatory, um, excrement being thrown at the door, uh, stones. Uh, my children and my wife uh, have been verbally abused on the street. I had um, a swastika on my, on my garage gate. I saw quite a number of BNP stickers the whole length of my fence. Another event two months ago in South London, the first ever election of a BNP councillor dramatically increased the number of anti-racist protesters. We are the coming storm. We are the coming storm. It was a night that ended in violence when victorious BNP thugs went on the rampage through the streets of Millwall. Against this backdrop of racial violence, two competing left-wing protest groups came to prominence. First to be set up in November 1991 were the anti-racist alliance, the ARA, formed as a result of Roland Adams' death. It's largely black-led, with support from TUC leaders like Bill Morris and the Labour Party's black section. With 75 MPs affiliated, the ARA believes in parliamentary action to combat racism. Its most prominent MP is Ken Livingstone, and its organiser and founder is Mark Wadsworth. Our way of operating could be summed up by the term community action and legal remedies. We don't put one uh, higher than the other. We mobilise on the streets in demonstrations, pickets and protests, but we also lobby government and every other institution in society that can create change, anti-racist change. A small majority of the membership is black. It must be fairly close to 50-50, um, a whole range of groups, a substantial number of, of Jewish groups involved. Um, I think now virtually every major trade union is affiliated. We do not believe in offensive violence. Make that categorically clear. But we do believe in self-defence. And should the fascists decide to march through a black area or a Jewish area or any other area where minorities uh, live and are therefore vulnerable, then we would mobilise to oppose them on the streets. The Anti-Nazi League, disbanded in the 80s, were quickly reformed as a rival group to tap into the growing anti-racist movement. Its public face consists of anti-apartheid campaigners like the MP Peter Hain, and they've claimed support from celebrities such as Lenny Henry and Stephen Fry. But other anti-racists believe it's a recruiting front for the Trotskyite Socialist Workers' Party, the SWP. More militant than the ARA, it fights racism by confronting the BNP on the streets. Its two main organisers, Julie Waterson and Paul Holbra, are both SWP activists. I believe that people are justified in preventing the Nazi march from taking place. And if that means that blocking their way physically, then that is the way in which it has to be done. The only reason the, the ANL was reformed um, was because suddenly the ARA had appeared, it got a lot of attention, a lot of support, and the old SWP suddenly felt, well, I mean, let's revive the ANL, it's a way of bringing people into our party and so on. And I think it was rather cynical. We actually have a whole army of volunteers that come into the I'm office. I'm saying the paid members, yourself, Julie Watson, are all SWP, correct? That, that's absolutely right. And I'm very happy that the Socialist Workers' Party is an active participant in the anti-Nazi league. Violence is one of their methods of achieving their ends. In what situations are they prepared to use violence? If the state goes against them. What do you mean by that? In the form of the police. If the police block their way, they'll use whatever means necessary to break the ranks. Why are you doing this interview in silhouette? Because I'm also fearful of reprisals. Who from? The Anti-Nazi League. Don't you think it's ironic that you as a, uh, as a black person are having to hide your face because you're worried about violence from another anti-racist group? The irony is not lost on me. He has no cause for fear whatsoever. The anti-Nazi League does not go around beating people up. Remember Stephen Lewis! The families whose children had been murdered in the racial attacks became the object of intense lobbying between the two rival groups. Although the families were anxious to help the anti-racist cause, they felt they were being exploited. The parents of Stephen Lawrence, murdered this spring in Eltham, wrote to the anti-racist alliance. 
to our dismay, we found the political agendas and rivalries of different organizations began to take over the meetings. To the Anti-Nazi League, they wrote, the wishes of the families were relegated by all organizations, including yours. The groups are political, they have their political agenda, and what's happened to us, I find, is quite personal, it's our son. And I just, be, I just think that I needed to hold that and not let them take, take off with Steve and Smain. Remember all his evil! No more racist murders! You've got so much to deal with. The police, the murder, the trial, and all you're getting at each stage is, come and join our group, let, let us demonstrate, let us actually organise your demonstration for us. It's all about demonstration, without actually having key reasons why they're going to do something. their agenda, their angle in addressing racism and whatever, and I think it tends to be, at least one of them at least, tends to be a little bit more related to the Second World War. In response to the Stephen Lawrence killing, the Anti-Nazi League planned a huge demonstration to the BNP's bookshop last month. But such was the rivalry between the two organisations. The anti-racist alliance, the ARA, held their own demonstration in central London on the same day. Their aim, to lobby Parliament, to make racial violence a specific crime. Attracting a crowd of 5,000, the demonstration passed off peacefully. But in the light of events about to unfold on the other larger demonstration, never had the divisions between the two anti-racist organisations been wider. The overwhelming majority on the anti-Nazi League march, one of the largest in recent years, were there to protest peacefully. Without officially advocating violence, there were factions within the ANL leadership, together with other left-wing groups under its umbrella, making warlike noises. With the BNP headquarters now surrounded by police, a fight was looming. Anti-Nazism had pushed anti-racism into the background. Nazi organisations like the British Nazi Party, British National Party, depend on violence. They their main organising uh, tactic is violence, it's about, their, it's about their street gangs and being able to intimidate people. Um, and so we don't believe that reasoned argument alone can defeat um, the likes of these persons and that really, if ever they did, God forbid, get into power, the, the violence that they would unleash against us, and which they are unleashing today against, against us, is uh, a justification in itself for responding in kind. Believing the march was heading for violent confrontation, the police had decided to put an exclusion zone around the BNP shop by blocking off the surroundings. They also claimed they had secret intelligence on troublemakers. I feel very strongly that there were, amongst the marchers, a large minority of people from a variety of subversive groups who were intent on attacking police, regardless of the issue. I don't doubt that there was an angry minority of people there who were outraged at the fact that the police had decided to block the route to protest against the BNP headquarters. I understand that anger and I sympathise with that anger. By now, the demonstration had reached the police roadblock. But who were some of the groups on the march? By far the largest were Youth Against Racism in Europe, YRE. Militant, who had been expelled from the Labour Party, had set up YRE to recruit young people from the anti-racist movement. Being a, a member of Militant Labour myself, um, we, we were more than, more than welcome to help uh, build uh, the, effectively the, uh, the section in Britain of U, uh, the YRE. Uh, we had a demonstration of 40,000. When people like Militant and the Socialist Workers' Party enter an organisation like the Anti-Nazi League, what they want to do is really two things. They go along with the purpose of, do, uh, of actually recruiting members from amongst the young, more idealistic um, supporters of that particular cause, and actually to, to provoke confrontation. Though the YRE leadership don't officially advocate violence, World in Action has discovered a hidden group of 25 within the organisation called the Away Team, used for defence and direct confrontation. In September, the BNP was celebrating their by-election victory at the Isle of Dogs. Separated by the police, the YRE's away team under an ANL banner were protesting on the other side of the street. Suddenly, YRE supporters, some dressed as skinheads, making up the away team, crossed over to the BNP side pretending to be racists. I herded, uh, herded the anti-fascists into the pen where the fascists were across the other side of the road. 
As it happened, the police mistook them for fascists. The police obviously have a preconceived idea what a fascist looks like. Short hair, um, baseball caps, things like that. And it's on film for all to see what happened after that. They got a roaster. The away team claim they achieved their aim of attacking and driving the BNP off the streets. Another youth group on the October march, smaller and also originally set up by militant to recruit black youth, were Panther UK. It had split into two halves before the BNP demonstration, one wing that believed in confrontation, the other that didn't. Uh, when you talk about the self-defence question, it's about the ability to organise the community so it defends itself. And that, that's period, and I think that the, the, the minority that split away thought that there was not enough emphasis on the practical side of that. Panther UK and Youth uh, Against Racism in Europe, they are not uh, groups that have been infiltrated by militants. What they are, they're organisations which have been set up by militants in order to infiltrate other groups, bigger, wider causes, like uh, the cause against racism. They can generate the kind of uh, hostility within marches and demonstrations which will lead to the violent confrontation that they literally believe in. That violent confrontation had already happened last May at a demonstration to the same BNP headquarters organised by YRE in Panther UK. The police on the October demonstration feared a rerun of scenes like these. Critics say the presence of mounted police was provocative. The demonstration came just a few days after the Stephen Lawrence murder and passions were running high. You can't expect people to peacefully march past the BNP office mm. and not express some kind of anger. We weren't going to go there to have a picnic. You know, I don't know if that's what the police expected, but Stephen Lawrence was the fourth person to be murdered in that area. You know, brutally murdered. We weren't there to sort of have a nice time. The way we are different is we are prepared to go out and take action as soon as mm. a incident occurs where there is a racial attack. By now, the demonstrators on the October 16th march were moving on police lines, blocking the way to the fascist bookshop. Negotiations to allow a small token group through had failed. The organisers wanted all or nothing. The march didn't stop. The march was stopped by the organisers, who then demanded of police that the march be allowed to go past the BNP bookshop. I mean, I posed the question, why? They'd been served with a notice nearly a week before that they would not be allowed to go down past the BNP bookshop. As the demonstrators pushed forward, they found all exits, including the alternative route ordered by the police, blocked. Frustrated and hemmed-in demonstrators began pushing and shoving. Placards were thrown. The riot police were moved in. Racism had been forgotten. It was now a fight with the police who blocked the way to the bookshop. There was one group there, anti-fascist action, who see racism as only a small component of a much larger Nazi threat. Allied with Red Action, a group even further to the left, they both believe in recruiting from the working class and using violence to deal with fascists. If the fascists use violence, we counter their violence. How do you do that? <laughs> By using violence against them. So you, you condone the use of violence? We actually promote it. I mean, the British National Party aren't, aren't mucking about. I mean, they're sort of seriously violent people, some of them. And if you, you're going to sort of enter into the arena where you're actually going to try and physically and ideologically combat them, you've got to be prepared to, you know, inflict damage upon them because they're certainly going to do it to you. Both these groups hold that the Anti-Nazi League is a middle-class organisation who have failed the white working class, so they target them for members. It also allows them to take potential recruits away from the BNP. We would say we're, we're, on the, we're on the left, on the left of the left. We're not Trotsky's. Trotskyism has felt it's, uh, it's become a middle class institution. Right? It's aimed particularly at students. There's no point going out with a leaflet saying smash fascism, smash racism, and the first time the fascists turn up, all the people you've gone leafleting with either get beaten, stabbed or chased off the estate. That creates a very definite impression on the people on that estate. The best thing you can do is physically defeat them on that estate. So all the people in the area can look round and see, you know, fascist gang being smashed. And then they might think a little bit more seriously about, well, reading what we've got to say. We were expelled from the SWP for being, for being working class.
for being uh, what they call squatters, which was being involved in organising squads to confront the National Front. Anti-fascist action described their most successful operation as the Battle of Waterloo, when they violently confronted a group of BNP supporters at Waterloo Station in September last year. A large number of tube stations were closed down in central London. The uh, police lost control of the station almost immediately. There was dozens and dozens of fascist casualties and there was hundreds and hundreds of militant anti-fascists operating in the area successfully throughout the day. To conceal their operations, both AFA and Red Action are organised in cell structures. It's very security conscious. Why do you have to be so security conscious? There's always the possibility that the opposition will try and infiltrate AFA. And as far as you know, has, has anyone infiltrated your group? Never happened. It's never ever happened? No. What would you say if, if I told you I actually attended one of your meetings? Sources in Leeds told World in Action there was an anti-fascist action meeting being held at the university. I do, sorry, I've told to come to a meeting. I've come up from Manchester. Local students attended and listened to some of their methods of organisation. You've been conned. I can categorically tell you that. What you went to was not an AFA group. Um, culminating in the incident of the Bradford 12, um, 12 region lines who were caught with petrol bombs, who were going to go on a cause of fascist march. Some of the anti-fascists are heavily involved in things they don't want people knowing about. If the fascists were armed, and you had to be armed to defend yourself adequately, then that's something you would have to do, obviously. Otherwise, it'd be lambs to the slaughter, wouldn't it? There were other sections on the march and aligned to any political group with violent agendas of their own. Groups like the Anarchist Class War, whose newspaper had told their followers before the march to burn down the BNP headquarters. Dress, face masks. Attitude, hostile. Our propaganda and our literature was telling people to go on that demonstration. Our approach was that the day should be used as an opportunity to attack fascists if possible and that people should come prepared. And it ended up that the police were being attacked? That's right. And is that justifiable? Of course attacking the police is justifiable. Um, for the vast majority of people in this country, particularly young people, their experience of organised fascism or racism does not come from the BNP or from the National Front. It comes from the police. When the police are on demonstrations of this type, their role is that of protecting fascists or stopping people venting their anger against fascists. But you're justifying violence here. You, you cannot fight violence with anything but violence. By now, pitched battles were going on with the police, who were making baton charges to disperse the violent minority. A key demonstration against racism had become a disaster. In pursuing a cause of anti-fascism, the ANL organisers had attracted groups bent on sectarian confrontation. The anti-racist alliance, the rival organisation, lost no time in widening the split between the two groups. Oh, I should imagine the British National Party were rubbing their hands with glee. It's exactly what they want. No one's discussing their policies. Now the question is the violence of the SWP, arguments between the police and the SWP about who was to blame. I mean... I should imagine the BNP would have been prepared to pay the SWP to organise that march if they'd asked. Unless these organisations actually understand what's happening on the grassroots, and that is to deal with the victims first, and understand what the victims require. Victims don't necessarily want demonstrations or wide, widespread violence. That's not the way forward. It should be a, uh, a united front because that's the only way we, I, th I believe, that we would get any justice. Because while you're sort of fighting between each other or saying what group is whatever, then you're never going to get anywhere. You need to, to stand united. Thank you.